Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, very, very, really enjoying being here and getting lots of new ideas and tidbits and, um, you know, streams of thought happening, which is very exciting. Um, so, yeah, so very briefly, uh, my work has involved an exploration of uh, shamanism. I'm sort of an outlier, I guess, at this event. But uh, my first book, uh, Breaking Open the Head, was uh, about psychedelic drugs, uh, psychedelic plants, visionary plants, particularly as used in uh, you know, indigenous societies, tribal societies. So I visited West Africa to work with a tribe called the Bwiti, who uses a substance called Iboga. I was in the Amazon in Ecuador, working with ayahuasca with a tribe called the Sequoia. Visited, visited the Mazatec Indians in, in Mexico. Uh, this led me to a second book, uh, 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl, where I was looking at uh, prophecies that many indigenous cultures possess around this time. Um, yeah, I guess in a way, like uh, I started as a, as a skeptic and a scientific materialist through undergoing all sorts of shamanic experiences in, in different contexts, my worldview shifted to embrace more of a, a mystical, uh, spiritual perspective, which was very surprising to me and, and something that I think, you know, we really can only access on an individual level if we, if we undergo our own journey of transformation and, and inquiry. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as she mentioned, the book that I'm finishing now is called How Soon Is Now? And essentially, um, it's about looking at the ecological crisis that humanity now faces as a collective rite of passage or uh, initiation, much like a shamanic uh, initiation. And um, I think like, um, yeah, the German Jewish critic Walter Benjamin, uh, writing in the 1920s, looking at the First World War, uh, noted his belief that humanity has a innate need, a kind of impulsion to commune with the cosmic powers, he called them. And that we are always going to either satisfy this innate need through ritual, through ceremony, through some type of, uh, you know, ecstatic celebratory event, or if that is blocked to us, it, it, it may happen that we end up releasing those same energies destructively. Um, you know, obviously humanity has known for about a half century or more, well, really even since the 19th century, that the path of industrial civilization was coming into conflict with the ecological support systems of the planet. And, you know, I think we now know that we've reached a critical uh, threshold um, that uh, we only have maybe a short period of time, 5, 10, 20 years, to really somehow redirect our uh, activity as a species on the planet. Uh, obviously, what's happening at WeShare and, um, you know, in other types of in engagements around the, the forefront of digital technology, you know, there's this prospect that we could kind of transform our social system so that uh, it is more in harmony with the planet, so people are collaborating more, conserving resources, sharing resources, and so on. Um, yeah, so... so so here we have uh, Walter Benjamin in the 20s, looking at the First World War in that sense. Um, an idea that's been explored a lot is that, um, you know, the, what makes us distinctly human is the prefrontal cortex, which only developed uh, in the last, um, you know, 100,000 years. And that's what allows us to process abstract symbols, to plan for the future and so on. Uh, an idea that um, the thinker Joseph Chilton Pierce uh, developed in his book, The Biology of Transcendence, is that uh, although the prefrontal cortex develops through adolescence, it actually requires a second kind of artificial shock to reach its full functioning. Uh, and that's why all these indigenous and traditional cultures around the world have initiation ceremonies uh, that are often very difficult. They could involve, you know, the psychedelic experience through ayahuasca or peyote, or they might involve an Australian Aboriginal culture, the walkabouts, where people have to fast and, and go on vision quests in, in, you know, in the wilderness and so on. Um, modern civilization was the first one that did away with these types of initiation uh, events. And um, therefore, people develop without that second, that second shock, which potentially leads them to shift from a purely egoic sense of identity to a more kind of like transpersonal um, state of consciousness, which even if you only have that experience a few times can act as a kind of permanent uh, reference point uh, where you're aware that, uh, there's, uh, that, that on some level there's a unity of, of, of consciousness uh, un underlying your, your separate identity. So I think that Western modern civilization ended up kind of caught in a trap, locked in its egoic structure, 
and based our whole you know, trip on kind of hyper-individualism, um, you know, uh, accumulation of resources, um, and so on. And um, yeah, we've now, we've now reached a point where we can't go further than that. And in a sense, you know, we could look at the idea that we've subconsciously, unconsciously somehow self-willed this ecological crisis to bring about our own transformation, our own transcendence. Um, you know, there's an idea that when disasters strike, people become destructive, uh, but actually a lot of people have noted that actually in extreme circumstances, whether it's Katrina or, or so on, uh, people actually shift out of that egoic structure and go into a state of compassion and altruism and sharing and so on. Now, obviously, we don't need to go through this kind of um, disaster as a species to you know, access that other capacity. But that seems to be the way we're heading now. And unfortunately, our society is basically programming people um, through media, you know, through systems of education and indoctrination to maintain kind of disempowered uh, members of a consumer society. Um, so yes, that's the, the basic thesis of the book. It's not that I think that everybody needs to take psychedelics or, or you know, whatever, but, but I do think that you know, understanding that we're in a, a species-wide crisis where our hyper-individualism is kind of keeping us from our next evolutionary um, kind of jump as a species uh, is very crucial. And once again, what we're, you know, when, I, when I think about what this conference is really about, it's really about you know, this potential, there's almost this question of whether the, the, the cutting edge of this technology is gonna allow us, I mean, is it something that the corporate system, the business system, the governments are gonna kind of assimilate into business as usual? Or is there the capacity for it to lead to a deeper transformation? And I really liked uh, what uh, Vinay was talking about the other day about, for instance, through the blockchain, the potential to actually have a global democracy. I and mean, I guess I've been brooding on his speech ever since he spoke um, and thinking about how he was talking about, you know, the West would really have to be willing to kind of reduce uh, our lifestyle significantly and almost go into a state of, um, you know, being willing to make reparations, you know, for, for the excesses of uh, colonialism. Uh, and we're seeing in a lot of thinkers right now, I mean, it's amazing, because you read all these different futurists and there's such a bifurcation. You have people like um, Roy Scranton, who wrote um, uh, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, who basically argues that it's too late to you know, deal with the thrust of our civilization towards destruction, and we have to just sort of surrender into that. Uh, and then you have uh, people like you know, um, the people who wrote Abundance, Peter Diamandis, who see technology evolving exponentially, uh, with the capacity to fulfill human needs on a global scale. Um, we see a, a book called Post-Capitalism by Paul Mason, uh, the work of uh, Jeremy Rifkin, who are pointing to this, once again, this I idea of a potential for an exponential scaling of uh, sustainable technologies, decentralization, uh, resilience, and uh, how, um, you know, we could, so, so we, we could actually avert uh, mega catastrophe uh, but it, but, it, but it, you know, by, by shifting into this mode of uh, distributed uh, resources, uh, you know, participatory democracy, relocalization within a truly planetary framework, you know, we have this, this precious opportunity over the next few years, we don't really know how many, to deal with this crisis. Does this resonate with people in terms of how they're feeling about what's happening? I mean, if you look at climate change, uh, species extinction, ocean acidification, the planetary boundaries model from the Stockholm uh, Resilience Group, uh, we're really at that, that, that critical juncture um, where it's kind of make or break. And to, to, to get through that that, that, that kind of initiatory journey that we have to make as a culture, you know, maybe we could look at the 60s uh, as a first stage of a voyage of collective initiation, you know, where people accessed, you know, mysticism, movements of civil, you know, society, so, social liberation, sexual liberation, you know, racial liberation, equality, and so on. But that only reached a certain threshold in that time, and then it got kind of reassimilated or reintegrated into the corporate mega machine. You know, so now we're at this next level of this, of this threshold of transformation where we, it's, and it, you could look at it almost like a birthing uh, process, almost like uh, contractions of, 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 of a birth. Um, you know, and the question is whether we are going to push through into a different uh, social model. And in fact, uh, another major theme of my book, uh, which other people have also looked at, is this idea that um, what's emerging is this potential for humanity to realize itself as a, a planetary superorganism, right? A superorganism that's in a symbiotic relationship with the Earth's ecology as a whole system, right? And um, 
you know, so, you know, if we think about that, if, if we see ourselves as like a giant hive, you know, we, we can see that that's also a trajectory of evolution. Uh, biological evolution is often making this shift from competition, aggression, domination, to cooperation and symbiosis. And we see a tremendous example of that in our own bodies, right? Our bodies were once, millions of years ago, colonies of microorganisms that were competing, you know, in, in, in an environment for scarce resources, trying to eat each other, consume each other, as like Lynn Margolis talks about in Microcosmos. And then somehow in the midst of crisis, these, the, these uh, colonies of microorganisms started to learn how to construct more complex you know, kind of structures together, such as skin and eye and bones and so on. And we can see that everything that we're actually doing technologically is kind of replicating, you know, stuff we already find in the microorganismic world, right? Like uh, genes are able to transfer, you know, sorry, viruses are able to transfer genetic information around the planet, like the Earth, you know, the Earth has a kind of internet, you know, through the, through the viral and bacterial world, through the mycelial world, which is able to learn how to break down different toxins and, trans, trans, you know, transmute them into nourishment and so on. So so, so essentially, it's quite possible that humanity itself is actually in still, even though we think we've separated from nature, we're actually in a kind of evolutionary biological process where we're, we're moving towards our next level of, of emergence, you know, a, a, a becoming aware of ourselves as a planetary superorganism and then acting from that perspective. In a, in a way, we would have to um, kind of reverse engineer where we would want to get to from where we are now, you know, much the way you know, Steve Jobs and Apple had to probably plan 10 or 15 years ahead for the smartphone, you know, and think about everything that they would have to learn and accomplish to get there. We can begin to think about how we would learn and plan ahead for, you know, resilient, decentralized, zero carbon, negative carbon society that we could potentially recreate in 10 or 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. And we know a lot of the technology is already uh, available. So that's kind of the basic thesis that I'm working with, sort of seeing, you know, if we can use the crisis as an opportunity for humanity to make a shift from um, a destructive path to a regenerative one. And I really love the idea of a regenerative culture, a regenerative society uh, as a deeper way of thinking about it than simply sustainability, which suggests the idea that we're going to sustain the old system when actually that old system is exactly what can't be sustained anymore. Uh, from this model, this paradigm, I think it's also interesting to think about, well, if humanity is emerging into the state of being a superorganism, uh, then what are the, the nascent organs of that collective body? And I think, strangely enough, they're actually multinational corporations. Like an energy company is kind of like the, the, the blood circulating through the body. You know, a sanitation company is like the liver or the kidney that's like breaking down toxins. Media companies, social technology companies are very much like the perceptual uh, mechanisms which are converting the raw data of sense perception into uh, memes, in, into kind of usable chunks, you know, for the, for the collective body. But, but unfortunately, where we are now, it's all happening in this paradigm of, you know, fear, insecurity, um, negativity, you know, the, the media is basically programming the collective body of humanity to not be aware of what's happening and what's facing us and how we need to change. You know, so we, with 18 seconds left, have that opportunity to, um, you know, make that shift. Um, and I think if we think about the possibility that corporations are these kind of nascent organs that are still in this kind of immature stage of competition, we could begin to think about what would be the next iteration of those structures. They would almost become something like transparent infrastructures that would be sharing knowledge and ideas freely that would, that would be supporting the health of the entire organism just as the organs that our body uh, is able to do. So that's my time, it wasn't very much, and it was very wonderful to talk to you. Uh, and come, come around next door, I'll answer any questions, we can chat. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel.